know, it's really important at these times to remember that um, there, there's a big difference between price and value. Um, to me, I've always found that if you don't have the anchor of, of valuation, if you don't understand how to value companies and what valuation um, is, then dealing in the markets on a day to day basis just becomes really difficult. Uh, all theories. Are false but some are useful so in the same sense all stock valuations are false but some are more useful than others and some are more rational than others that's a great way to put it well first of all satire um retails to retails luxury goods so yeah the people who are buying gucci uh prada and tom ford and the like are not probably really squeezed by inflation yeah. I mean, I haven't used the service. Obviously, I'm not in the market for luxury goods. This is a um, this is Saba, by the way, but it's maybe 12 year old Saba, <laughs> not luxury. Um... Hello, and welcome back to another episode of What's Not Priced. In happy news to all of the viewers, uh, Greg has rejoined us today this week again. And there were some happy fans on in the YouTube comments saying, welcome back, Greg. So, Greg, thanks for gracing us with your presence again on this podcast. <laughs> no worries, Kirill. Good to be back. But uh, I, I did check the the numbers and they were well down on previous guests. So, oh, no. uh, you know, we can't get too Maybe excited. it's something to do with the algorithm, you know, take it up with YouTube. But um, we've, got a, we've got a nice episode today, which is all about stocks and, you know, valuations and how investors should approach uh, assessing stocks uh, and that's probably because we've taken a different approach I think this week uh, based on some maybe realizations we've had about the utility of focusing too much on on macro so you know I think it matters a lot what we pay attention to there's so much information out there you know data facts are boundless but our attention is limited so we'll all have the same amount of uh, quantum of attention. So what separates us from the rest is what we choose to pay attention to. So uh, that said, obviously, there has been a lot of talk about what the Reserve Bank did and you know the news conference and the monetary policy statement and the revised forecasts. But I think um, in, the, in the words of Callum Newman, our fat tail colleague, he said, F the RBA. So I think we won't focus too much on the macro stuff today and i think you had some some thoughts as well about the utility of focusing on on macro well the thing is i think we said this before like it's good fun it's interesting yeah. you can talk about it you can weigh things up but at the end of the day it just adds to the noise and i think the realization that i certainly had uh over the christmas break and which is one of the reasons why it's important to always step away because you can uh break some habits and you can get uh, a different perspective on the habits that you have um, built throughout the year. And I think one of the uh, probably less than useful habits uh, I built or we built on this show was sort of getting away from the crux of what we're trying to get at yeah. and sort of focusing um, a little too much on the day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week news stories. And that mm -hmm. is really getting sucked into the the narrative of the day, which is what you don't want to do. Um, you want to try to remove yourself and be an observer without being caught up in it and about without yeah. being a part of it. So I think the the best way to, to try to get out of that habit is to just say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna involve myself with it. I'm not gonna mm. um, don't be ignorant of it, but don't yeah. join in the conversation, don't add to the noise. So um, this week we want to talk about, uh, we want to talk about some stocks and we want to talk about some some valuations. And I think one of the things that I was doing um, or have been doing over the past few weeks is going back over a lot of old school um, investment books that I've had mm. in the in the bookshelf for years. And, and one of the problems when you read a book and you put it in your bookshelf is you don't tend to read it again. Yeah. Um, and so so one of the one of the things I found, and this is just from the the, the Warren Buffett's letter letters mm -hmm. and from his 2019 letter, which is not that long ago. Yeah. Um, and pretty much whatever letter of Buffett's you pick up and read, you're always going to find something useful out of it. But you know, especially reading his stuff makes you focus on what companies are doing mm -hmm. and not what the market is doing in reaction to that. Yeah. So I just mm -hmm. thought it, it um, just this little pithy little sentence or two. 
Um, so he, he in the 2019 uh, letter, he laid out his um, list of companies that he invests in. So mm-hmm. Berkshire Hathaway invest in operating businesses, which they own outright, and yep. then they invest in a bunch of listed mm-hmm. investments that are the value fluctuates quite uh, widely because they're obviously stock market listed yep. investments and they have to mark those uh, investments each year and say, okay, what's the value of them this year? So the value of them at the end of 2019 was $248 billion. And he said, Charlie and I do not view the $248 billion detailed above as a collection of stock market wages, dalliances to be terminated because of downgrades by the street and earnings miss, expected Federal Reserve actions, possible political developments forecast by economists or whatever else might be the subject du jour. What we see in our holdings, rather, is an assembly of companies that we partly own and that, on a weighted basis, are earning more than 20% on the net tangible equity capital required to run the businesses. These companies also earn their profits without employing excessive levels of debt. So basically what he's saying is we don't care what the market thinks day to day about what the Fed Reserve's doing, Mm -hmm. whether there's an earnings downgrade, whether they've missed their estimates for that quarter. Um, as long as the underlying business over time uh, is generating an acceptable return on the equity capital, then they're happy to continue holding it. And I guess the magic of Berkshire Hathaway is they are more patient than the rest of the market and they compound their capital. So any dividends they get from their business, they reinvest back into new Mm -hmm. businesses and continue to compound at high rates. Um, To me, that is really what people should be focusing on. And the reason why they don't focus on it is because most humans are impatient. They want to do stuff Mm -hmm. all the time, which is fine. And there are many, many services out there that cater to impatient investors. Um, I just don't want to be one of them. So uh, with that said, um, let's get into it. What have you got for us, Carol? Well, I think just building on what you said about Warren Buffett, I think he famously also said that he considers himself and Charlie Munger to be business analyst first and foremost rather than market analyst or security analyst so that was another one of his quotes so he focuses on businesses first and foremost but which is exactly what we're yeah. investing in right we're investing exactly. in businesses although yeah. there are um methodologies trading strategies that focus on the psychology of the market yeah. so they're taking advantage of different things whereas Buffett and Munger recognize the psychology of market. They certainly do take advantage of it. And I think mm. one of the um, one, of, one of the areas they most recently uh, took advantage of is when the oil price plunged mm-hmm. back in 2020, 2021. They've taken some really big positions in yeah. some energy stocks on the back of that. And then they might wait another five or six years before they take another real big plunge. They're waiting for those opportunities. But from their perspective, they're just waiting for the psychology of the market to throw up value and at the moment as we discussed last week there's not a lot of that around yeah well now we can talk about the valuations of stocks which are, this is maybe the, the core of the podcast and the core of stock picking investing uh and i thought I, maybe we could take a look back so our very first episode was 37 episodes ago in late may 2023 and it was just when nvidia became a household name you know People were talking about it in Ubers and taxis, in coffee shops, uh, and it had its first you know, big mainstream breakout. And we sort of said back then that it's likely that the valuation has probably plateaued. You know, if it's in the news, it's likely already in the price. Obviously, since that episode, the stock has gone up nearly 80%. Um, it's now a $1.7 trillion US dollar company, which is massive. And I think in, in the last six months alone, I think Nvidia has added about 700 billion US dollars of market capitalization which is crazy because you know it's it's bigger than some of the most iconic US companies combined like you know Coca-Cola and uh, Procter and Gamble uh, I think also it, just to show its popularity I think we can use that maybe as a branching off point to just talk about valuation in general and how markets maybe fluctuate and how Mr market can be wrong sometimes or volatile sometimes. I think uh, NVIDIA is also now the most popular stock for hedge funds. So Goldman Sachs has a index where it sort of tracks what the top constituent stock is for the top hedge funds in the world. 
And I think hundreds of hedge funds in the US now have NVIDIA as their most popular stock. And that has only been in the last maybe 12 to six months. So it's not just hyperbole to say that NVIDIA is the most talk stock, most talked about stock in the world that and, you know, lots of people are putting where the money where their mouth is. So maybe a few questions. Back in May 2023, were we wrong? Uh, is the market wrong? Or can we sort of, you know, maybe shift the conversation a bit and say, you know, the facts changed. And, you know, since we had the episode, you know, the outlook was revised more positively and the stock was re-rated. So what, what do you make of, uh, of NVIDIA's rise? Okay, so... Uh... Short way of saying it is that obviously we were wrong because when you sort of say, look, you know, the good news is priced in and it continues yeah. to go up 80%, you're not factoring in, um, you know, whatever else is because yeah. that, that's a big move for a stock, yeah. right? Like that's, uh, you know, for, and, and for a stock of that size. So clearly the the AI revolution has buoyed, buoyed the stock. At the end of the day, though, the stock price, I mean, I'm not sure what the value of NVIDIA should be longer term because mm -hmm. it's clearly going through uh, a cyclical uh, boost and probably a bit of a structural shift as well. Um, but there will be competitors that, that that come out, so who knows where its sustainable uh, returns are. Uh, the fact yeah. that it continues to be so popular, um, I would say the same thing now, as I said uh, 12 months ago. Um, history tells you that when that type of uh, enthusiasm for a stock happens, then there are increased risks. So yeah. um, I wouldn't change my view. I think the other thing to say is that um, that it's you know I think Buffett talked about it. It's what's your circle of competence, um, and yeah. and if your circle of competence isn't in that area, then you just stay away from there. And it, and you're not right or wrong. It's just you've decided that you don't really know. So there's no point trying to figure it out. Um, I think one of the best things that I read on it was something that you sent me earlier today, and I, I think it was a comment from, uh, from the Financial Times or something like that. So perhaps yeah. you could uh, you could read that out because I couldn't have said it better. Yep. Okay. Where is it? Okay, it's here. So it's uh, from the Financial Times Alphaville co column, which I highly recommend. Everyone's very funny, but also very informative. Anyway, this is what it said about uh, Nvidia. It said, "Who knows when it will." Uh, when it will happen, but it does look like NVIDIA, excellent company though it is, is on the way to become another classic momentum-fueled hedge fund hotel that will eventually collapse in hilarious fashion. There are no stupid investments, only stupid prices. Yeah, I think that sums it up. I, I, I particularly like the hedge fund hotel yeah. comment, um, and that's generally what happens in in the US and this is a, a, all around the world really it's a psychological aspect when mm -hmm. a company has earnings growth when a company um, is delivering which uh, Nvidia clearly is mm -hmm. everyone wants a piece of it everyone wants to to, to chase that uh, chase that stock and it gets to a point where the price just becomes silly and whether the price is silly for Nvidia at the moment I don't really have a view on it um, mm -hmm. But I don't need to. I don't. You know, it's it's one of those stocks that uh, I don't know enough about in order to confidently say whether it's crazily overvalued or whether there's still value in it. But um, when there when there's such enthusiasm for a stock, I'd prefer to, yeah. to look elsewhere. It means there's opportunities elsewhere, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think we always say you know, high expectations make for for high disappointment. I think we'll we'll get into dominoes which was an example of that but you know a stock's price is, is is not a reward for past performance it's a bet on future performance so with nvidia you really have to ask yourself how much of outstanding future performance is already baked into the price you know is the market already looking into 2025 2026 we don't know so that's just some of the questions that a an investor has to look at if they're not already invested in nvidia at this moment but obviously NVIDIA is at the moment delivering on expectations. There was a stock, Australian stock, that didn't deliver on expectations, even though it does deliver pizzas. And I'm talking about Domino's. <laughs> Greg, you've, you've recently uh, written a nice piece on that on, on Liveway, so maybe you can expand on that. Yeah, I think, you know, talking about um, the way, you, you know, the, the sort of rational way to look at, look at companies, I thought... <clears throat> 
uh, what was it? Domino's recently um, updated the market with the trading update. Mm-hmm. It was uh, <clears throat> obviously worse than expected and the stock price fell sharply. And uh, I sort of purely looked at the company from the perspective of, you know, it's, it's down significantly from its 2021 peak when obviously that was buoyed by uh, everyone staying at home during COVID and ordering pizza. So that was um, abnormal profits. Uh, but it's down 50% in the past 12 months. Yeah. So um, down significantly, uh, is there a value opportunity there? Clearly um, it's a, you know, it's a decent business. Uh, it's got good, good economics. You know, is there, a, is there a value in, is there an opportunity to, to invest? And when I looked into the, the detail of it, it wasn't so much the business uh, or the operating business that concerned me. It was more about, the capital allocation decisions of, of management and how they go about financing their growth. And the the concern of it is that um, the market prices dominoes as a growth as a growth stock. I think that yeah. you know it's on a multiple well, it was on a multiple of about of about 40 times before it yeah. made that announcement. And then when you the 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 way that you think about value and growth is that uh, a growth stock is a stock that reinvests uh, a high proportion of its earnings and it reinvests mm-hmm. those earnings and generates a uh, decent return on capital. So it compounds that growth. And then the market rewards that business for doing that. Um, so Domino's has a high uh, forecast return on equity. And I think mm-hmm. I just assumed its uh, return on equity is around 30%, which is around about where mm-hmm. consensus estimates have its earnings over yeah. the next few years. So 30% return on equity if a company's reinvesting its earnings and generating a high return on that, yes, it's value stock. It should be, oh, sorry, it's a growth stock. It should be priced as such and trade on a on a high multiple. But when I looked at it, I realized that Domino's is actually distributing 80% of its earnings as a dividend. So it's only reinvesting 20%. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking, well, hang on, hang on. How is it growing if it's only reinvesting 20% of yeah. its earnings? And then I looked at uh, I looked at the uh, the balance sheet um, over the last couple of years, and, and what I found was quite interesting. So, what I'll do is I'll just read um, what I wrote in, in in the Livewire article, and I said in 2019, net debt was around 550 million. As at the 2nd of July 2023, which is the last balance sheet date we have available, it was around 825 million. So we've got a decent increase over the past few years. And then I just added, as an aside, included in this are bank loans totaling nearly $1 billion on an average interest rate of just over 2%. But the loans mature in one to five years, according to the notes buried on page 237 of the annual report. And I concluded that a higher cost of capital is coming for dominoes because when those yeah. loans come due, obviously they're going to be paying a higher, pro- uh, a yeah. higher cost for that um, than 2%. And then I said in 2019, Domino's had retained earnings of around 200 million. So what are retained earnings? As the name suggests, they represent the portion of earnings that the business retains for growth. And you can find that at the bottom of the balance sheet if anyone's interested. Yeah. So the retained earnings were, uh, were 200, um, 200 million in 2019. And then in t- July 2023, retained earnings were just 216 million. So that was quite interesting because a growth company that's reinvesting its earnings yeah. should be growing its retained earnings. Yet from 2019 to 2023, that only grew 16 million or 4 million a year. And then I said, so how is this a growth company? So then you look at issued capital, which is the equity capital it raises uh, uh, when it issues shares. So. Yeah. That increased from around 200 million in 2019 to 430 million now. So what does all this mean? And I said, put simply, Domino's funds its growth by issuing debt and new equity, which totaled around 500 million over the past four years, rather than retaining earnings and letting those earnings compound at high rates. Mm -hmm. To the rational investor, this makes no sense. As such, it doesn't make sense to invest in this enterprise either. The business itself is a sound one, but the capital management policy is poor. So I guess it's one way I look at companies like that is to say, okay, there's a lot of talk about is a company a quality company? Does it do the right thing by shareholders? Um, 
And in a situation where a company is paying out 80% of its earnings to shareholders, yet pulling in more money from debt and, and issuing new shares mm-hmm. on the on the other on the other hand, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, so if that continues for dominoes, I can't see how the share price remains where yeah. it is. I mean, there, there might be other circumstances that say it's going to uh, generate a higher return than what it currently is, and therefore that justifies it. They might change their dividend policy, which means they retain more of their earnings to fund growth. Mm-hmm. But if they continue on the same path, uh, to me, then that's a recipe for a lower share price. And, th- and this is the sort of way that I... I try to think about companies and clearly have learned this from from Buffett. You look at companies as companies, not as singular share prices moving up and down based on, you know, just looking at earnings per share. You try to look at how is the company allocating their capital? How what is the company doing with their earnings? Are they paying them all out as dividends? A company that pays out 80% of its earnings as a dividend generally should be considered as a value investment Mm -hmm. um not all the time but just as a sort of a rough rule of thumb um because if then if they're only paying out if they're only retaining 20 percent of earnings Mm -hmm. they can grow um organically but it's very difficult for them to grow by investing in uh new markets in in new plant and equipment or they might have very uh special business models that don't require huge amounts of investment. And we'll have a look at one of those in a moment. Um, mm-hmm. But that's just generally the way that you should think about uh, the companies that you invest in. What are they doing with their earnings? Um, and are they being rational in the way that they do it? And for a company like Domino's with a high return on equity should be reinvesting earnings and compounding mm-hmm. that growth. And it's not doing that. So a uh, bit of a concern there. Yeah. And I think also uh, one measure is obviously return on equity. Another one is, I think, return on incremental invested equity. So you look at the difference between how much um, the company invested between two years and how much they actually made in those two years. And obviously, I think you just read that they issued a lot of capital, they issued a lot of debt, but the actual incremental profit from those capital outlays wasn't that great. So I think if you look at incremental invested return on equity, it's probably a lot lower than what they say on their return on equity is on the balance sheet. And I think the best uh, book, if you want to be interested in capital allocation, is Thorndike's, uh, I think it's called Outsiders, which I think profiled eight of the best CEOs in recent decades and how they chose to allocate capital for their business. So just a suggestion there. But Sounds like a good book. I actually, well, you mentioned... Yeah, I think it's um, it's a good book if you, yeah, outsiders. Uh, but I think you mentioned, obviously, a, a business that manages its capital a bit better. It's a very capital light business. So I thought maybe we can turn to that. And it's the luxury retailer Satire, which was in the news lately, I think this week, released a very strong update. Uh, obviously, we've heard that retail sales, sales in aggregate in Australia are sort of a bit depressed. Uh, people aren't buying as much as they used to, but Satay came out with an update that I think it's um, year on year sales are up, I think 90%. So that's a huge improvement. So what's going on there? What's what's going on with that business? Cool. And why do you find it so attractive? Well, don't forget- In terms of its capital light nature. Well, first of all, Satay um, retails to, retails luxury goods. So yeah. the people who are buying Gucci- uh, Prada and Tom Ford and the like are not probably really squeezed by inflation. Yeah. Um, probably don't have mortgages and kids going to school, and mm-hmm. um, so that they that's yeah. I think their target market is slightly different to uh, yeah. to other markets where where people might be struggling. But this is a really interesting business, and what I did is I, I might just. Um, bring up the balance sheet just so people can get a sense of what uh, I guess what um, what represents a, a clean balance sheet versus one that mm-hmm. might be a little bit more tricky. So uh, I know to many people balance sheets are just a bunch of numbers and essentially they are, but it's also like a photo of the of the capital sort of efficiency of a yeah. business. So just want to point out a couple of things here that most businesses generate their uh, income and their profits. Well, all businesses generate income profits from their assets, but this 
non-current assets is generally includes stuff like um, um, you know buildings or equipment, yeah. um, right of use assets where it's you know they, they've rented out um, space that they've they've got a um, you know they've got a they put all their stuff in satire doesn't have any of that all it's got is a platform and that's i'm assuming that's what the intangibles are around mm -hmm. are about so its assets are essentially intangible assets that it may or may not have to invest in to to maintain you know clearly they've got to do a little bit of investment but it's not like a mm -hmm. a miner that has plant and equipment that that deteriorates and depreciates and needs to you know constant capital mm -hmm. going into to uh, to replace that. So this is the type of business that has virtually um, no capex requirements. So all the cash flow that comes into it, or the vast majority of it, is free cash flow, um, which mm -hmm. then increases the valuation of the business markedly. And if you look at the the net assets of this business, they're forty seven million, and that's the equity that um, shareholders own essentially. Mm -hmm. But of that, you've got a hundred million that's in cash. So if you take a hundred million of cash out of this business, the, the uh, debtors of financing, financing the business, it's a hugely profitable business. Um, there's, there's two ways to look at it. You could say this is almost like the perfect business in that all it is, is a investment or all it is, is a, a platform for, re for people to go on to and buy stuff, it doesn't actually mm. hold um, any inventory. So mm. uh, the, its its platform is is like locked into its suppliers. So when an order goes through, I think essentially the, the suppliers um, ship the goods. All uh, Setire is is a facilitator uh, of putting um, consumer and supplier together mm. to to increase their business. So it's it's a very interesting business. I guess the question you would ask is how long does it survive like this? And I'll just go back to you now, Kirill. Um, you know, how, how long does this business or how, how, how long can this business survive and, and generate the profits it's generating? Uh, do its suppliers, because it, I mean, I haven't used the service, obviously. I'm not in mm -hmm. the market for luxury goods. This is a, um, this is Saba, by the way, but it's maybe 12 year old Saba, <laughs> not luxury. Um, yeah. But uh, so, so do, do, the, do the suppliers start to think, hang on, we're, we're, we're uh, exactly, lowering yeah. our price point here um, and sort of undercutting our brand value in a way. And this company's making a ton of money from us. Like, do we, mm. do we continue to do this? And, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but these are the sort of things as an investor you say to yourself, okay, this is a great business now. Is it going to be a great business in five years' time? Is it going to be a great business in 10 years' time? Or does some other model come along and, um, or does some competitor come along to, 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 the, to the luxury good retailers band together and decide to build their own? I, I don't know, but there's a lot of uncertainty about how, how long that can go on for. But in the meantime, the market doesn't care. The market's saying, Earnings per share growth outperforming better than expected. Share prices going up, um, which is fine. But as a longer term investor who who is investing in a business, you say to yourself, "Well, maybe as a short term speculation, this could be interesting." Mm -hmm. But longer term, I've got no idea. And when you don't have a, a solid idea, it's better off not to not to get involved. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a company that has definitely captured the imagination of the like i think the local analyst community because it operates i think it's what's called the luxury gray market and i think both the new york times and the australian financial review have both written not necessarily hit, hit pieces but they've sort of raised questions on exactly how satire operates you know and whether it gets consent or whether you know the brand like the biggest brands like gucci and prada you know are they aware of satire are they letting it happen or what, what the relationship is there and exactly how does satire's logistics actually work but it's clearly working at the moment but the question is will there be more competition you know will the actual suppliers themselves think you know maybe i can just miss, set up my own website and sort of ship it out to, to people like that and i don't need to go through satire as a platform so there's definitely questions there but 
uh, it, it's been on a really strong run in the last 12 months, although it, it did fall substantially also, I think, I think a year or two ago. Uh, so watch out for that. On, also on the topic of satire, obviously, uh, I think it's in competition or it operates in the same industry as something like Farfetch and Sense. And I think uh, in late December, uh, Farfetch had some issues with raising liquidity. So I think it's sort of struggling financially at the moment. So w- watch this space. But uh, what stock would you want to talk next? Because I think we've got some really nice uh, Australian idols. Uh, which idols are you talking about? We've got, well, ma- maybe while we're on retailers, we can have a quick look. Nick yes. Scarly is another example of the maybe a more sustainable business. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the market, um, you know, its profits have dropped from mm-hmm. in 2024 from what they were last year. So yeah. the market probably um, anticipated uh, a little bit worse than expected. But this week, Nick Scarley came out with, um, with a pretty strong result. And I think we've spoken about this before on this show, but um, for viewers who might be interested, what I like to do, I talk about return on equity a lot. And what I like to do yep. um, is is break that down by doing what's called uh, DuPont analysis. And that essentially breaks the return on equity down into portions. And one of the portions is net margin or net profit margin. Yep. The other portion is asset turnover. And the final portion is the, uh, it's called the um, equity multiple. So it's really just how leveraged the balance sheet is. So with Nick Scarley, its main contributor, I think it's got a forecast return on equity this year of around 40%. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a highly profitable uh, retailer, um, but its net profit margin is uh, forecast to be 18.6% this year, which is a very, um, very strong profit margin. Yeah. Uh, when, I mean, the nearest retailer I probably could compare it to Harvey Norman, which is eight point three percent. So it's it's got a really strong profit margin. Asset turnover is isn't isn't anything uh, you know. So it doesn't turn over its um, its assets a lot. Asset turnover is different to stock turnover, by the way. So I'm not yeah. um, referring to that, but it's just how efficient a company uses its mm-hmm. assets, and the higher that um, turnover number, the more efficient. Uh, it is, mm-hmm. and then it's um, it's it's assets to equity multiple is about three times. So there is a there is a, a, a leveraged effect that happens mm-hmm. with that net profit. So the net profit is is leveraged a little bit um, by the mm-hmm. by the leverage in the company. But a really good result from Nick Scarley. Uh, it doesn't distribute. Sorry, it distributes a, de- a lot of its earnings because it doesn't mm-hmm. have. It's it's a local uh, business. I yep. think it bought Plush uh, Furniture yep. a couple of years ago to expand, but it's um it's a very well managed, very capital efficient business. Um, doesn't issue. I think it's had the same amount of shares on issue for years. Mm-hmm. Doesn't um, issue uh, equity unless it's um absolutely necessary, and it hasn't been so because it generates enough cash. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's a good example of a business that um is is very sensible in its uh, capital allocation. Uh, strategy yeah and i think uh something that we've also talked about before throughout the show is you know it, it matters what the, the market expected and i think the market probably expected a lot what the results to be a lot worse than they were and so when the the results came through the market was pleasantly surprised that things aren't as bad as they anticipated uh, so that's probably something to keep in mind and when i mentioned this to you you said that you know, that's probably why you shouldn't pay too much attention to aggregate results like the retail sales started from from the ABS or something like that, which goes back to our discussion about the utility of focusing on macro or th- this utility, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there's just, you know, amongst the retail space, there are good retailers, average retailers and bad retailers. And I think mm-hmm. um, when you when you focus on a macro bearish story about uh, consumers being under the pump, you tend to lump them all in together, um, yep. and and rather than sort of focus on the quality ones that might not be um, as badly affected, or where the price is more than compensating or more than factoring in a lot of that risk, um, you know, you can get you can sort of lump stuff into to a to a sector rather than look at the the potential outliers there. So um, that's just another reason to to sort of ignore the the, the broader the broader data that comes out 
not necessarily ignore it completely, but don't put too much uh, stock in it. The other two stocks I just wanted to, to mention briefly, mm-hmm. and these are ones that were, I think we've brought up um, before, and they're just sort of two stocks, one that represents sort of the large caps and one that represents mm-hmm. the mid caps, um, Commonwealth Bank and uh, car sales. Um, what I did on my valuation model is I just – looked at what the forecasts were for these these companies over the next couple of years and then sort of mm. worked back and said okay what is it what's yeah. the, what uh, implied return is the market going to get from these companies if those forecasts are hit mm-hmm. um, and Commonwealth Bank investors at these levels are getting an implied return of six percent per annum um, so when you consider that you're getting uh, what about 4.1 percent from a government 10-year bond yield mm-hmm. um, at these levels. You're getting a little less than two percent equity risk premium uh, for Commonwealth yeah. Bank. So to me, that's pretty thin. You're not getting a lot of uh, potential reward for the for the risk you're taking there. Um, not to say that you know the market won't continue to behave mm-hmm. like that and be and accept that. Or Commonwealth Bank might outperform on its earnings forecast and might actually do better mm-hmm. than what the market currently expects. But based on those uh, returns uh, or based on those forecast earnings, the market's uh, pricing at the moment is implying a 6% return. Uh, and for car sales, it's implying a 5.5% return. So uh, car sales is on a price earnings of about 38, 40 times. So it is mm-hmm. pretty stretched. Um, so... I guess you would want car sales to do better than what the market is, uh, the one analysts are currently expecting it to do. You want it to uh, to beat expectations. Could do that. Um, I'm just just pointing out that right now the stocks that are popular in the market, the stocks that have delivered mm. the growth and have, um, I guess, made investors feel at ease with their uh, with their strategies. The risk is getting getting tighter and it goes back to what you said earlier like there's no there's you know it doesn't have to be a bad stock to be a bad price and sometimes prices just aren't rewarding you for the risk you're taking Uh, and I think that just needs to be considered not to say that you know the market can't continue like this who knows Um, but you don't have to you don't have to participate you can sit back and wait for the uh for the market to to become a little bit more rational in its pricing and i think that's what i'm certainly looking at doing uh in in the weeks weeks ahead waiting for the better opportunities to come yeah and i think we mentioned that warren buffett who who's obviously famously said that he considers himself more of a business analyst rather than you know, a security analyst uh but i think even he obviously had ways to figure out what a fair price is uh, because I think, and we've mentioned this before, but it it, do, it does really matter at what price you buy the company. Because if you buy it where the expectations are so high, even if it's a really wonderful business, it might not really have outstanding returns because the market has already priced it into perfection. I think uh, Cisco Systems, I think, is a little bit like that, where it's clearly still a, a strong business, but. I think even to this day, it hasn't uh, breached the peak that it hit, I think, in 2000. So yeah, right. uh, wonderful businesses can still be bad stock investments because you still have to factor in what the market already reflects in the price. Absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the return that you get from an investment over the long term is very much dependent on the price you pay. Yeah. Um, so it's it really is as simple as that. In the short term, who knows? You could. It doesn't really matter what you pay if the if the mm. market's moving in the direction that you need to, as long as you're smart enough to, to take the profit. But um, I'm certainly not smart enough to do that. So I'll take the take the long the long view. I, I think. Yeah, I think that, that we mentioned the the Financial Times. I think that that same column said that. You know, betting against uh, Nvidia right now or Microsoft right now is a bit like you know going in front of a momentum steamroller. So it's you know it's 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 a bit risky because I think at the moment a lot of the capital is flowing there, and you know momentum traders are also joining the trade. But you have to maybe think long term. So I think um, you know, time arbitrage, is, is, as some investors like to say, you have to be more patient than some others. There's a lot of value in in patience. It's just not really apparent when you're. Uh you know, when you're looking at these situations. And I think, you know, what one of the things that I pointed out to something I wrote to to my subscribers today was that, you know, it's really important 
these times to remember that um, there, there's a big difference between price and value. Um, and yeah. a good example was, um, you know, yesterday, for example, uh, Woodside came out and said, hey, mm-hmm. we're not um, – we're not going to go ahead with the merger discussions with Santos and Santos share price fell about, what was it? Eight, eight percent or something. Santos's intrinsic value did not change a little, you know, one bit from the day to the day, the day after yet the share price fell 8%. So that's just a really good example of, um, of how price and value are two completely different things. And sometimes they meet and sometimes they're very much, very much apart. Mm -hmm. So, um, to me, I've always found that if you don't have the anchor of, of valuation, if you don't understand how to value companies and what valuation um, is, then dealing in the markets on a day-to-day basis just becomes really difficult because you can't help but get sucked into the emotion and you become mm. a part of the emotional crowd that that's where you lose all advantage. The advantage comes from trying to remain away from that, trying to remain uh, emotionally stable and, uh, and and knowing what the difference between price and value is, and when you do that, you can mm. uh, you can make the right decisions at the right time. Yeah, which I think, it, which is probably why it's so useful to hear your thoughts on valuation, because a lot of the times in the media or the maybe podcasts, it, the valuation isn't really spoken as much. Maybe they'll talk about the price earnings multiple, but there isn't that. Uh, you know, deep anchor of what the actual valuation is, which ties back to the deep fundamentals of the company, the balance sheet, the return on equity. So I think that just helps yep. maybe anchor people's expectations of, you know, and maybe helps you know uh, investors actually understand what it is that's actually at the heart of investing. You well, know, to, valuation to be, is to be fair key. as well, um, uh, you know, there is, I'm not sure the right way to put this, but there, there's, there's no such thing as... Uh, a value like everyone will have a different and and buffett's even mentioned this before he said look you know we don't ever reveal our intrinsic value calculations because they change uh and mine will be different to charlie munger's because they they both sort of do things differently and it all depends on your assumptions so the the most important Mm -hmm. assumption or the two most important assumptions uh, in 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 valuation, uh, the discount rate that you use. So yep. whether you choose to, um, uh, you know, so the ten year uh, bond yield at the moment is is let's say it's four percent. Do you choose mm-hmm. to have an equity risk premium of four percent? So using an eight percent discount rate, do you choose an equity risk premium of two percent, or is it higher? So whatever you choose is going to determine what your valuation is and then the other thing is what do you choose for a sustainable return on equity for a company um and if that company has a lot of debt do you adjust for that there's all these different considerations Mm -hmm. so there's no such thing and i don't want people to think that there's one such thing as a as a value for a company but what you have to do is try to be rational about what your inputs Mm -hmm. are and um and then and then say okay well that value seems like it's a a rational, reasonable valuation to me, um, as a as a investor in the business, not just as a stock market mm. speculator, uh, and that's where your anchor should be. Because at the end of the day, longer term, that's how uh, companies are priced. They're priced f- rationally, yeah. but in the short term, and we're always in the short term, um, they're priced irrationally, uh, and yeah. that's where the patience comes in. You just got to have the patience to move in and buy when that irrationality puts them well below what you think might be a, a, a rational long-term price and then you stay away when the market's pricing them well above that that rational valuation um yeah so, i think yeah. What, what was that um what was that saying that you know some all theories are false but some are useful so in the same sense all stock valuations are false but some are more useful than others and some are more rational than others that's a great way to put and it that's really the key i like that Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, on that note, I think we will we will leave it there. I think hopefully the the viewers enjoyed more of a more of a pivot towards the true heart of investing, you know, valuations and trying to figure out what the key is to the fundamentals. Uh, Greg, thanks for joining me again, and uh, see you next week. No worries, Carol. Good to uh, good to chat stocks, mate, and we'll uh, catch up again soon.